All right, everyone, welcome to the second in the Oral Revolution East Bay Justice Town Hall series. Uh, this one is the Education Justice Series. And uh, I wanna welcome everyone today uh, and everyone here. Uh, special thanks for everyone that's coming and gonna watch on the live stream. Uh, a quick note for everyone watching on live stream, we're gonna be taking questions later. And uh, if you leave your comments in the Facebook or YouTube chat, we will get them and ask them on the live stream. So let's start with the, uh, the Our Revolution East Bay Justice Town Hall series, where we examine justice from every angle. So what does that mean exactly? Well, exactly what it sounds like. We examine justice from every angle, criminal justice, education justice, environmental justice, housing justice, and uh, on and on. And last time we had the criminal justice series with the uh, history track. So the reason we have the different tracks and the different hist and the history track is actually pretty simple. From an engineering standpoint, it's extremely difficult to solve a problem if you have no idea how you got the problem. So we need to uncover the history of how we got here and maybe even the misinformation that's getting us here. So that's what we're gonna be covering today. Our Revolution East Bay was founded in the wake of the Bernie Sanders 2016 campaign to continue its work in, with leadership from Nina Turner, Jim Hightower, Larry Cohen, Ben Jealous, James Ogby, and many, many other notable progressives. Last cycle, we won 25 out of our 35, 34 races endorsed locally, and we won 70% of our endorsed races nationally. We are the only truly national grassroots progressive organization fighting at every level of government. And we invite all of you to join us at ourrevolutioneastbay.org. This uh, education series is gonna be co-sponsored with the Badass Teachers Association. And I'm gonna hand it over to my co-host, uh, Melissa, to talk about uh, the BATS. Thanks a lot, Jake. And I wanna thank you very much for asking us to co-sponsor this event with you. The grassroots movement in itself is very important because that's when you can really stay true to your own voice, such as BATS has over the years. But also I am a member of our revolution out here in New Jersey for Atlantic County. So I was really excited to get invited to do this event. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about BATS. I won't talk too long because I'm not the one you came to see tonight. We were first started as just a Facebook group way back in June. 2013 and in 2016 we became an actual nonprofit. But in the years leading up to where we are today, we did a lot of kind of putting pressure on decision makers around public education. And we did a lot of work to change the narrative of how public education was being viewed. And some of our speakers tonight will go into how it was viewed then and some of the changes that came. Uh, since we really started advocating for public education, not just us, other organizations as well. Uh, some of the events that we uh, created, uh, hosted, participated in, in 2014, we did a march on, on DC and we had a protest in front of the US Department of Education. We protested Arnie Duncan and we actually made so much noise that we ended up getting asked to come into the Department of Education and have a conversation with him and some of his people because they really couldn't understand why we were so mad at that point in time. Uh, in 2015, we recognized that teachers were really, really stressed about not being heard about working conditions. So we created this kind of, started out as an off the cuff, hey, let's do a survey so that teachers could express how they feel. And we ended up with something like 30,000 participants in this survey. Teachers, educators at this point just wanted to be heard. And that has uh, kind of spanned into a lot of work uh, back then with the Department of Education as well as with NIOSH talking about educator working conditions and what it was like to be an educator. In 2016, we testified at the US DOE around the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act and some of the regulatory changes that they were proposing. Also, that happened to be the same date as the Friedrichs versus CTA Supreme Court case hearing. And we had actually submitted an amicus brief. So we were actually running between the Supreme Court and the Department of Education to make sure that we could get our testimony heard, but also sit and watch this event unfold and on the courtroom floor. Floor. Uh, after that, we went out to Seattle and we joined with Journey for Justice uh, for an equity and education conference. We recognized at that point being mostly a group of white educators, reflective of the education workforce, that we had a lot of work to do around understanding what equity and education was. So we kind of did it in a more internal conference to 
work through some of those issues and come up with our platform and mission that we uh, stand by today with 10 points about what it really means to push for equity in education. And then, uh, of course, came the presidential elections and the election of our previous president. Uh, we recognized that federally a lot of work was not going to be able to be done. And we also realized that in order to make some of the deep rooted changes that we needed to see, we needed to, to get local and we needed to really organize in our communities, our local districts and our states. So we, we turned towards kind of uh, strengthening organizing models, making sure that people knew how to create change in their own state and their own areas. And that's what we're coming out of these days. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Melissa. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thanks to the BATS for uh, co-sponsoring this with us. We couldn't think of a better group to help us, you know, stop the privatization of public education. Um, so let's go ahead and get on, get started with the uh, with the town hall. So again, this is the first part, part one in the series of uh, education justice. Today's speakers are Anthony Cody, Dr. Jack Schneider, Dr. Jennifer Berkshire, and Mike Hutchinson. And since we created the town hall series, not only to educate the public, but to educate the public officials, because they are the ones empowered to apply this knowledge immediately and quickly. And so in that vein, we have our Q and A panelists here. Uh, we have Ellie Householder from the Antioch School Board, Ben Bartlett from Berkeley City Council, Lamar Thorpe, Antioch Mayor, and Gail McLaughlin, uh, Richmond City Council. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to Melissa, and she can uh, introduce Anthony Cody for us. I do actually, I'm very honored to be able to introduce Anthony Cody. Uh, Anthony was one of the first voices that I listened to when I was learning about the privatization of public education and what had happened in the past. Because originally as an educator, I was just worried about my own classroom and my own silo. And I began to read a lot of what Anthony had written. I have hung out with him in person and he's a very honest and truthful voice to listen to. So Anthony has worked for 24 years in the Oakland schools, 18 of them as a science teacher at a high needs middle school. He's a national board certified teacher and he's now leading workshops with teachers on project-based learning, something I am an immense believer in. He's also the co-founder of the Network for Public Education. Thank you, Melissa, thanks very much. Um, well, I want to talk um, today about sort of the the area that I that I ended up developing a little bit of expertise in, which was um, the role of philanthropy in public education, um, and really a sort of a form of almost predatory philanthropy. Um, Melissa kind of gave you a, an overview of my um, a little bit of my history. Um, I just mentioned that I that I wrote a blog called Living in Dialogue um, that that was on Teacher Magazine at Education Week for for uh, about six years and then was independent. It's still up there um, as livingindialogue.com. I haven't been writing much in the last few years. Um, I helped organize the Save Our Schools March back in 2011, which brought about 7,000 educators to Washington, D.C. Um, to protest the Obama administration's education policy, race to the top and all of that. Um, I had a dialogue with the Gates Foundation um, back in 2012. Um, that led to the book that uh, The Educator and the Oligarch, um, which was pu published a, a few years after that. And as Melissa mentioned, I helped start the Network for Public Education back in 2013. Um, so one of the things that we discovered, um, as we, you know, as we started, some of us started looking at why, um, sort of what was going on, where, what was the source of all of this education reform that started getting, um, you know, really with No Child Left Behind, especially, we got a, a, this whole wave of reform in the early 2000s. Um, and where, was, where were the ideas for this coming from? And we discovered that um, a lot of the, the initiative was coming from 
philanthropy. Um, and when you scratch the surface, you discover there's something called strategic philanthropy, which is a way to retain control of large amounts of money and invest it even for profit. Um, and you don't have to pay taxes on it. And you can use that money to shape public, public policy. Um, you can redirect then large, much larger amounts of public money because of course, education is largely publicly funded. And then you're, you're treated as some kind of a hero because of your, your largesse. Um, and, you know, so it's kind of a win, win, win for somebody like Bill Gates or, um, you know, a number of these other folks. Um, so we have uh, the Gates Foundation, we have uh, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, the Broad Foundation, the Walton Family Foundation, Bloomberg, Koch Brothers. So all of these, you know, multi-billion dollar foundations uh, have been directly involved both in um, the nonprofit sector and actually also in um, some of them in funding political candidates that align with their with their views. And um, so, you know, so it's both philanthropy and there's also direct political involvement. Um, these um, philanthropies fund uh, and sponsor the development of AstroTurf groups um, that are active, you know, groups like Educators for Excellence, where you have to sign on to agree to support using test scores to evaluate teachers. Um, they sponsor journalism. Um, the Gates Foundation sponsors, uh, donates to the Education Writers Association. Um, they sponsor journalistic projects like at the Seattle Times. They were sponsoring some, something called the Education Lab for a while. They sponsor think tank reports. Some of these organizations like the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, they will write these uh, pseudo academic reports that um, are really advocacy papers that complain about how terrible teacher evaluation systems are because nobody gets fired or you know and or um, take up take up various aspects of the education reform cause um, they even uh, groups like teach for america sponsors congressional staff members so that if you're a member of congress they'll give you a free staff member and it's a direct pipeline into your um, office, and that person isn't even paid by that congressperson, they're paid by Teach for America. And of course, they're delivering, you know, their, their um, message within the, within the, within the uh, congressional office. Um, they also uh, fund a lot of civil rights groups, donate to a lot of civil rights groups, which might have something to do with why civil rights groups often appear as advocates for, um, for um, high stakes tests. Like right now, we're, we're in this fight over, should we still have, uh, you know, standardized, should the Department of Education mandate standardized testing at the state level um, during the midst of a pandemic? And uh, a number of these civil rights groups are coming out in, in support of that um, and it could have something to do with um, the, the history of donations, uh, the history of funding that they've received from, um, from some of these foundations. Um, I mentioned the dialogue with the Gates Foundation. One of the individuals I was involved with was uh, a man, a former teacher by the name of Urban Scott. And um, this was a statement he made to a group of teachers that the Gates Foundation had assembled um, where he told them, we're trying to start a movement, a movement started by you, a movement you're leading. And it was just like the perfect encapsulation of sort of this weird dance that they, that they get involved with, with these AstroTurf efforts where they, they sponsor these things and try to prop these groups up 
and then use them to to advocate since since you know it it doesn't sound so great to have the gates foundation directly it's much better if they can get some teachers to stand up and say we want to be evaluated by our test scores we're sick and tired of of uh our colleagues you know you know not being fired for their bad test scores um the uh you know the one of the things i discovered with you know when i was working on all this stuff trying to make sense of what they were doing was they really have a, a an ideological belief almost a religious belief in the power of the private market to um revolutionize industries and um so there's a lot of emphasis on um getting rid of the public aspects the common aspects of the education system and replacing that with competitive systems um so they want to get rid of elected school boards they want to get rid of teacher unions um they want these schools to be competing for for parental for parents who would choose them and ultimately um there's been this sort of a weird um back and forth over accountability because um tests have been used as sort of a billy club on the schools to prove that the schools the public schools are not working um and the tests is kind of from somebody like bill gates's point of view you know in the absence of tests how do you know how well a school is doing how do you know well a teacher is doing how do you know how well students are doing well you have to have some benchmarks and so you have to create standards and the more standardized you can make everything then the more you, comparable everything can be then you can reward those that are doing well you can punish those that are doing poorly it also has another ideological effect which is it kind of creates this illusion of a meritocracy that our schools are allowing you know the the best and brightest to rise and um be rewarded by their you know preparing them to take more tests to get into college and then college you know and so on and so everything is is kind of on this meritocratic system um the problem is that the tests are not accurate measures of accomplishment and are really rooted in a lot of racist assumptions about how intelligence can be measured um and they divert teachers and the school systems from actually addressing the needs of their students and instead create this artificial rat race where where students and teachers are are caught up in in trying to trying to um prove that they know you know that they can regurgitate this this canon of uh western knowledge um they also you know connecting back to the to the issue of um the civil rights groups there's always this promise well we need these tests to see where we need to direct additional resources you know and this was the justification for no child left behind that's why ted kennedy got on board with it supposedly and you know made this alliance with um with the republicans because the the idea was well we'll get extra resources for these for the low scoring schools um and then of course it it just was used to to um prove that those you know as evidence that those schools were not adequate and then we have this sort of bait and switch where we shift start shifting funds to charters we start shifting funds to vouchers and then under devos you actually have um a move the the a move away from test based accountability because they they want to now to use those vouchers to fund schools that are actually demonstrably incapable of teaching 
you know, when you talk about a lot of the online schools that really do such a miserable job at delivering any sort of educational excellence. Um, so they've sort of, so, so some of the um, advocates of choice have shifted away now that, you know, now that the work of discrediting public schools has, uh, has been accomplished to some extent, they just want to say, well, if parents are choosing it, that by itself is evidence that it's effective. And, and it's, it's almost a consumer, consumer model where if the product is being sold, then we don't really care what, as long as the parent's happy, the kids can be learning that, you know, dinosaurs coexisted with people, that Noah's Ark was you know, was how the animals were rescued, et cetera. You know, there's not, there's not really a meaningful definition of what, um, of what real quality learning is. Um, so, you know, we've, we've kind of had a sequence of these experiments. Um, the Gates Foundation was very big on the first two on this list, the Common Core and teacher evaluations based on test scores. Um, we had uh, Eli Brode, um, his, his foundation sponsored um, training of superintendents who then were sent out to districts like Oakland and elsewhere where they, where they implemented a lot of ideas that were drawn from this, this outlook. You get uh, things like portfolio districts, which is where you just kind of include all these different charter schools and, and uh, in your district and you create this whole marketplace of, of options for parents, um, this big expansion of charter schools, vouchers, online learning, and all under this, this rubric of parental choice. Um, what we're seeing as a result of these experiments and this market-driven ideology is the uh, systematic abandonment of the commons return to overt racial and economic segregation in the schools, public funding for religious education, destruction of the teaching profession, and what we're seeing now more and more is a lot of fraud and cronyism and profiteering in, these, in the charter school sector. Um, and we mentioned the, the Network for Public Education. One of the more successful hoaxes that they pulled off is this idea that charter schools are nonprofits. And the, a large segment of the charter schools are, not, are formally nonprofit, but then they hire a for-profit entity to manage. And um, so there's a report that, that the Network for Public Education just put out that talks about this whole hoax and really exposes a lot of the specific instances where this is taking place across the country. Um, and we've been working to try to influence Congress to stop the, uh, the Congress has been putting $400 million a year into uh, spawning new charter schools across the country and um, and so we're we're trying to uh, lobby Congress to to halt that um, and making some some impact, but it's it's an uphill battle because this is this has really um, been quite a tradition for quite a while. Um, so that's that's kind of what I wanted to share with you, sort of an overview of what what philanthropy has been up to over the last ten or fifteen years, um, and I'll let it. Uh, pass the pass the mic on to the next speaker. Great, thanks, Anthony. <clears throat> so our next two speakers uh, are Dr. Jack Schneider and Dr. Jennifer Berkshire. Jennifer, uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll I'll dive in. Go ahead, dive. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And then uh, and then you can tell everybody what I forgot to talk about. How about that? That sounds great. All right. Uh, so uh, since the word history has been applied to this event, and since I was trained as an education historian, I don't, I don't really do that work much anymore. I tend to do uh, more 
present policy analysis work. Uh, Jennifer and I have a new book out that um, is really about present policy efforts to unmake public education. But um, I got excited seeing that word history there uh, and uh, decided to, to take us way back in time uh, and talk a little bit about the founding ideals of public education. Um, and it's worth noting uh, that those ideals were not always fully realized or even partially realized, um, that they eventually become realized more and more over time. Um, and I'll, I'll continue to talk about the ways in which they haven't been realized, but it would of course uh, be ironic to talk about um, you know, the ideal of uh, an integrated public school uh, in the 18th century, um, when of course, you know, a, a massive percentage of young people uh, were uh, turned away just on principle um, because they weren't a part of uh, the racially privileged group. Um, they weren't uh, a part of the ethnically privileged group, the linguistically privileged group, the religiously pri privileged group. So um, be bear with me uh, when I say that the origins of public education are rooted in a democratic ideal of um, diverse young people coming together. Now, of course, that definition of diversity was in the 18th century, right? When we're talking about the founding period, um, a very limited conception of diversity. And it expanded over time because of the way that marginalized racial groups, uh, new immigrants, um, non-native English speakers, uh, families with students with special needs fought to be included. Um, the reason they were successful over time, uh, mostly, uh, is that we took those ideals seriously. Uh, and eventually, um, the ideal of a system that serves everyone became more and more realized. Um, so when we think about this ideal, uh, my old mentor, David Labrie, always referred to it as democratic equality. Um, and this is the original mission of public education. The reason why the founders in the 18th century, and we didn't have a public education system at the time, but the reason why they strongly supported the idea of taxpayer funded public education is that they believed that we could not keep our republic without it. Um, that public education was too important to be left to the whims of the marketplace, um, which should strike us right now in this moment as ironic, given uh, how much policy is being proposed from state to state right now that would expose public education to the market and in fact would end public education, would privatize public education, ed education such that it were a consumer good like any others. Um, but the, the founders believed that uh, the skills learned in school. Um, and, you know, these were a broad set of skills, not merely those that could be tested by a, uh, at the time, not invented standardized test. Um, uh, this would be um, skills that are needed for citizenship uh, in a democracy, um, but also far more than that. Um, going to school with different kinds of people, learning how to live together. Um, that's a phrase that Thurgood Marshall would take up um, what would that be about 150 years later? Um, so when Thurgood Marshall wrote in a famous dissent that uh, our children need to go to school together if we are ever going to learn to live together, right? He's building on this ideal of democratic equality. He's tapping into that and reminding us of this original purpose of public education. This begins to change over time. Um, you know, first we get this big push for public schools. Uh, it's called the common school movement uh, in the 19th century. So it begins around 1820, carries through the Civil War. Um, and during the common school era, you know, you get leaders like Henry Barnard and Horace Mann who are making the case for the same kind of uh, public education that the founders were making, right? That this should be for everybody in the community. Again, I'll note their definition of everybody at the time was quite different than ours, much to the detriment of American society and particular groups. Um, you know, we're talking about uh, African Americans, we're talking about Mexican Americans, uh, who America um, essentially captured uh, by expanding its borders and then rejected from its education system. Um, we're talking about kids with special needs uh, who were turned away at the door until about the 1950s and 60s. Um, and so 
um, this this idea of democratic equality um, was the the driving ideal of public education through the common school era up through the end of the Civil War, and then actually um, continued to be a driving ideal in Reconstruction. So if you look in Southern states in their constitutions, um, funding public education was one of the criteria for readmission to the Union after the Civil War and opening it up to everybody. Um, this was, again, because the idea of public education was not about getting ahead. It was not about advancing the economy. Uh, it was not about preparing young people with 21st century skills, whatever that means. Um, it was about building democracy and ensuring something resembling equality. Um, so what changes? Um, in the, the early 20th century, we get a new kind of thinking introduced into public education, and it can be distilled to the phrase social efficiency. Um, the thinking was that the schools could sort people for their places in life, that the schools could identify talent um, and channel those people into places where we needed talent, that the schools could identify merit and make sure uh, that the most meretricious people were being rewarded, um, that the schools eff uh, effectively could be doing the kind of sorting that we see in our society today, but would be doing it faster, smarter, and fairer. And of course, we know that the history of that is kind of an ugly one. That's where we get tracking. That's where we get the introduction of intelligence testing. The first standardized tests uh, came during this period. And uh, again, we see some of these efforts to sort people, um, like tracking, for instance, hewing really closely to, uh, to demography. So, um, Racially marginalized kids were the most likely to be tracked into uh, vocational programs, low income kids as well, kids whose parents were not speaking, uh, were not native English speakers. And um, we can actually see this thread today, just like we can see the democratic equality thread run through to today in the way that many of us still think about the purpose of public education. We can see this social efficiency piece. Um, so Anthony mentioned Arne Duncan, mentioned Bill Gates, mentioned a lot of people who um, are you know, big believers in the idea that the schools will sort people. Um, Arne Duncan talked relentlessly about preparing students for work uh, and uh, using education as a way of uh, competing in a global economy. Um, competing in a global economy uh, is something that, you know, we may want to do, um, but our education system was not designed to do that. A lot is lost if that's all that we talk about. Um, and it's not necessarily the best way to prepare people, people for work. Um, there's a great new book out by Tina Groger that describes actually uh, the uh, rise of vocational education as an intentional, intentional way of breaking craft unions, um, of uh, preparing people in school so that they didn't have to be prepared through apprenticeships and other forms of on-the-job training. Um, there are reasons to be skeptical. Um, the third strand uh, that we see if we're thinking about the motivating values of education, but we don't really see until about the 1950s, and that can be described as social mobility, the use of education to get ahead. Um, prior to then, really we saw a system that uh, was so limited in terms of access for young people that um, the only people who were graduating, uh, you know, by let's say the early 20th century, the only people who were graduating from high school tended to be from racially and economically privileged families. Um, but there's a push to open up the schools. Uh, and that push in the early 20th century was driven by people's belief that those who were getting a high school education were getting ahead because of the education. And in some cases that was true, right? They were learning a lot of things that actually mattered and that helped them get ahead, um, that it wasn't just about credentialing. Um, and so they fought to get their kids access to a high school education. And we know that as high school became more and more accessible for people, um, that a college degree became the new status barrier 
childbearing credential in education. Today, we can see um, that many families are pushing their children to go beyond a BA and to get a graduate degree as a means of distinguishing themselves in the marketplace. So this use of education, this is a third use, the use by individuals as a way to gain an advantage over others in a society that has limited rewards and that is seeking a way to, to dole those rewards out. Um, we believe in this country in the myth of meritocracy. We believe that if you went to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or you know a number of other high status schools, that you're smarter or maybe you've worked harder than other people. Um, but of course, there's a very strong correlation between uh, academic prestige, uh, you know, attending a high status college or university, and being from a high income background, a high income household. Um, so this use of education, um, we see uh, rising more and more over the decades to the point today where it's almost the only thing we talk about uh, when we're talking about education, right? Education as a private good, not as a public good, not as something that is good for all of us, right? When we think about why do we fund education with public tax dollars? Why do we do that, right? Why don't we say, it's your kid, it's your problem, you go figure it out. Or why didn't we say, it's your kid, it's your problem, but you don't have any money, so we'll just give you some money and you go make the choice. Um, we didn't do that because there was a recognition that we all benefit from this in the same way that we all benefit from roads and parks and clean air. We all benefit from having an educated populace. Um, and again, over time, this idea of who is a part of the populace, who's a citizen, who's included, who's an American has expanded uh, and has become fairer and has become um, something that better realizes this initial vision of democratic equality. But of course, what we talk about most is uh, the private good, right? What, what's good for me and my kid? Um, what can I get my kid in education to give her an advantage over other kids. Um, and this is why we see things like opportunity hoarding, right? This is why we see parents moving to school districts because they looked at the greatschools.org rating and they don't know a thing about the school, but they believe that it will give their kid an advantage. This is why there are US News and World Report rankings of colleges and universities, right? There's an, an entire culture and system of structures that support the use of education as a private good for people to get ahead. And we, of course, we we know that in the competition of all against all, those with the most privilege are going to win, right? We are essentially going to have a privilege laundering machine in which the most advantaged enter into the school system, and then they come out the other end having been you know, blessed with uh, the, the uh, veneer of meritocratic worth. Um, it isn't simply that they're privileged, it is that they are smarter and harder working than everybody else, and that's why they ended up on top. And that's why they have disproportional access to social and economic goodies in our society. Um, what we need is to remember why we are doing this in the first place. Um, we need to remember that public education is a public good. It is a public benefit to all of us. This is why we fund it with our tax dollars. This is why we don't leave it to the whims of the market. Um, this is why we don't say, you know, go ahead and, and teach your kid whatever kind of science you want your kid to be taught, right? Because these young people go out and they become members of our society, right? We are all affected by that. In the same way that air from one city that is produced does not stay there, it moves around, young people go out into our society and they act on it. And so what we ought to be doing, instead of talking about things like, you know, funding the child, as Betsy DeVos used to say, um, give a family a voucher so that they can choose whatever kind of education they want, public or private. We should instead be talking about what are the ways to capture that ideal of democratic equality? What are the ways that we can make our public schools truly public? And that requires much different policies like seeking full racial and economic integration in our schools, fully funding our schools, making sure that if our schools aren't fully integrated, that schools serving historically disadvantaged kids actually have more to work with to try to close the education debt that is owed to particular kinds of communities. Um, ensuring that 
teaching is a valued profession and that teachers are adequately remunerated for their work such that we have well-qualified people who enter the schools and who stay in the schools and who don't feel like they are being deprofessionalized through a slew of relentless reforms designed to narrow the mission of education. And then finally, we ought to be thinking about what's the full mission of schools, all right? It isn't to teach kids what a machine can grade on a, a, a standardized assessment in two subject areas, right? That's not the full mission of school. Uh, the full mission of school is to prepare young people for their lives, uh, to prepare young people to live together and work together, to be members of communities. And that requires a whole lot more than just teaching them math and English such that they can pass their standardized tests. All right, I'll step there and I'll kick it over to Jennifer. And then if between the two of us, we haven't covered everything, we'll eventually get to it. So Jack and I have spent the last few months talking to all kinds of groups all over the country about the book, but I think this is the first event we've done where history is in the title, and I cannot recall a time when I have seen Jack Schneider this excited. So thank you, Our Revolution East Bay. You've done something really wonderful this Saturday. So our, our book tries to answer a very present day question, which is how did something as old as school vouchers come roaring back to life? And, and we are now seeing it being sold across the country as a quote unquote disruptive innovation, right? As though it's a sort of Elon Musk um, trip to the future. And so the two of us, um, I'm an education journalist, Jack is a historian. We really tried to, to answer that question. And we didn't know as we were writing the book, obviously, that a pandemic would happen and that schools across the country would suddenly have to shut their doors. So I think we probably understate in the book the danger to public education. I think that the last year has really been a wake up call about the really the precarity of a foundational institution. But I just want to, you know, I think we're all a little bit in a blue bubble, um, both, you know, we're in Massachusetts, you guys are in California, but in states all over the country, something like 25 states, leg state legislatures have introduced these uh, measures that don't just expand private school vouchers, but introduce very, these sweeping proposals that would either give money directly to parents and, you know, let them take the money and direct it to a private school, or they, they open up the spending more broadly than that. The, the, um, the disruptive innovation of the day is called an education savings account. And as we look back through history, we discovered that the first time that this appears is actually during the Reagan administration, right? That the, the Reagan folks introduced an education savings account. And so when you hear people across the country now um, peddling it in states like West Virginia, where they've enacted a sweeping version, or in New Hampshire, where they're uh, debating it right now, it's being talked about as though it's something brand new, but in fact, it's very old. Um, what happened, though, was back in the Reagan days, when this idea first came up, it was widely rejected. The public responded with, you know, pretty much outrage. They, they thought that the idea of steering tax dollars away from public institutions to private religious schools was really offensive. You know, the idea that, that you could be denied entry to a school because you didn't believe in a particularly, particular faith was one that people had a really hard time swallowing. That that seemed pretty, you know, foundational and fundamental, right? We have this thing called, called freedom of religion and separation of church and state. Well, a lot has changed since then. Um, I joked on Twitter the other day that, you know, you may be surprised that we don't really seem to do separation of church and state anymore. And one of the things that's happened is that we've had this sort of long parade of court cases, Supreme Court cases, chiseling away at this idea. And so uh, not only do you have states with these elaborate workarounds that enable uh, taxpayer dollars to fund religious schools um, via tax credits or, or scholarship granting organizations. But increasingly, there's a push to basically compel states to fund private religious education. So as Jack and I 
traced this history. I mean, I think I in particular, because I'm not an education historian, I was really surprised to see how far back this went and that, that basically you had had people making the exact same argument in the 1990s that we're hearing today. So what happened? Why was it that in the 1980s in a state like California, when school vouchers were put on the ballot in 1993, people voted it down two to one? We have seen this happen again and again. So why are, why, what caused them to come roaring back? Well, there are a couple of things, and one I'm going to enlist Jack's help in explaining. But, uh, you know, uh, a real, like, I think where we have to start is that the way that the Democrats started to talk about public education really changed. Some of this has to do with what Jack was laying out. This idea, this embrace of education as a private good. This idea that really took hold in the 1990s that education was primarily ar around about workforce preparation. Um, the Clinton folks love to talk about, you know, you what you earn is what you learn, right? And that we were going to be a country of, win of winners and losers, and that the people who were left behind, well, that was pretty much their fault. And that if you, uh, if, if you were going to get ahead, you had to invest in yourself. So we fast forward to today, we see that that view of education has turned out to be really corrosive, right? That we have only a third of people in our country hold bachelor's degrees. So what kind of message does that send to everybody else? That, you know, if you didn't get ahead, it's your own fault. So we've got that problem. And then basically, you know, the Democrats really started to talk about education in a way that made privatization seem much more palatable. Back in, in the Reagan administration, I went back and looked at the newspaper coverage when he and his then Secretary of Education, Bill Bennett, who may be familiar to some of you, when, when they first rolled out their idea that the money would follow the child, right, that they would make funding to low-income schools quote-unquote portable, and, and people responded like, well, isn't that going to leave the kids in the, uh, the kids who, are, who stay behind, isn't that going to leave them, leave them worse off? Well, what happened in those intervening decades that now arguments that are even more extreme are basically just repeated by a gullible press, but, but also, you know, we don't seem to have uh, language for pushing back. And a lot of it is that centrist Democrats in particular, neoliberal Democrats, as I'm fond of referring to them, really embrace the idea of education as a private good that was primarily around about workforce preparation and that we needed to embrace this ethos of competition, right? That parents should be able to choose their school the way they choose any other consumer good. And that was the thing that would lift that was the tide that would lift all boats or it would sink the losers. And that was OK, because we shouldn't have, you know, if schools were failing kids, they shouldn't be allowed to keep going. And so when you go back and you look and hear the Reagan people using this identical language, it's like, wow, we now Democrats talk that same way. And we're left in this kind of crazy situation where suddenly an institution that's so foundational to our democracy is looking really vulnerable. It's looking really shaky. But when we need uh, Joe Biden, for example, to come out swinging and make the kind of case for public education that he's been making for voting rights, he doesn't really have the vocabulary to do that. That they are, you know, they're so used to talking about education in this really desiccated way that all the only thing that they're really able to reach for is talk about test scores, for example. So Jack, I, I want you to cover one last piece of this. Uh, Jack and I have a podcast, and often what we do on the podcast is bring in other historians and experts, and we had somebody from California, David Menifee Leiby from uh, Pomona College, to talk about the breakdown of the coalition that I think Anthony did a nice job of laying out. And that was this idea that you had Democrats who were all about accountability, joining forces with Republicans who like the idea of private school vouchers, and they compromise and they everyone goes all in for charters. And as Jack's going to explain to us, that, that uh, coalition has unraveled and it has profound implications 
for not just public education across the country, but states like California. So Jack, I, I know this is one of your favorite questions, so you take it away. Yeah, great. Uh, so I won't use the, the language of democratic equality and social efficiency and social mobility other than to say that when we're talking about the economy, we're talking largely about social efficiency and when we're talking about getting ahead uh, and you know uh, the sort of bootstraps ethos, uh, we're talking about social mobility and we're talking about what public education actually is and is for, we're talking about democratic equality. Um, and uh, in the 1980s, uh, that was the sort of the last era where we saw a real difference between Republicans and Democrats, particularly at the federal level in education policy. So Republicans still favored religion in schools. You see Reagan making speeches about that. They still favored vouchers. Reagan, as Jennifer mentioned, lost on that. Um, they were still, uh, you know, pushing for uh, textbooks to cover particular material and omit other material. Um, the Democrats were still supporting unions, had not yet given up on uh, school integration, and were still pushing for an increase in funding. Um, and what we see in the 1990s is a kind of detente where the neoliberal Democrats essentially make an alliance with mainstream mainstream conservatives to say, um, let's shelve uh, the policy efforts that are too far to the margins here. Let's let's shelve the far left stuff and the far right stuff. Um, Democrats, you stop supporting teachers unions. You give up the push for racial integration. Um, you give up your push for more funding in schools, and we on the right will will give up the religion in schools piece at least for a while we'll stop pushing for vouchers um, we won't bring the culture war anymore um, and let's work together to uh, advance a vision of education um, that uh, is rooted in a kind of uh, marketplace ethos that will strengthen the economy, uh, that will sort young people uh, in our society and that will lift them up uh, through their hard work, right? This is a kind of neoliberal ideology that conservatives also subscribed to, at least with regard to education. And the things that they pushed for were standardized testing, right? High stakes tests, um, because again, the theory there was that um, this is what corporations do, right? Schools should be run like businesses um, and uh, that they should also be exposed to the market. Again, this is the, the neoliberal centrist conservative logic here of improving education by shelving the more uh, ideologically extreme um, policies that they had been pushing forward and building a kind of consensus approach to education policy. And that's what we've been living in for the past several decades. Um, that's why there's no difference between uh, George H.W. Bush's education plan and Bill Clinton's education plan. No difference between Bill Clinton's education plan and George W. Bush's education plan. No difference between George W. Bush's education plan and Barack Obama's education plan. They differed in many other ways, um, but not in their approach to education. And then we got Betsy DeVos, and Betsy DeVos broke the treaty. Betsy DeVos decided to dredge up some of the old conservative dreams like vouchers. Um, Betsy DeVos decided that um, that was her moment, right? And she was essentially right that even though she didn't drive any of her policy uh, forward, she normalized it through her rhetoric. Um, and she really gave voice uh, to conservatives at the state level. And that's where we've seen the deepest attacks on public education. So Californians don't have to drive too far to get to Arizona, um, where there's just really some scary stuff happening in public education, right? Public funds being loaded onto untraceable debit cards, pulling money out of the schools and going to pay for, they don't know what, because uh, this is by design. The, the plan is to pull money out of the public schools and give it to people. And who cares where it goes as long as the public education system is weakened such that eventually it collapses and they need to build a private system. Um, so uh, DeVos saw that the neoliberal Democrats had essentially paved a runway for her and she decided she was gonna try to land an airplane on it. Um, and then all the, the centrist Democrats seemed really surprised that she was doing that. 
horrified, right? Cory Booker was horrified that um, this woman who he had shared stages with was suddenly doing the thing she had always wanted to do. Um, you know, sh shame on these centrist Democrats for not seeing this coming, right? For them, this was uh, this was the the final compromise, right? Charters which expose schools uh, to some limited uh, degree of uh, the influence of the market. For centrist Democrats, that was it. That was the final compromise. That was the end of the story. How naive, right? Of course, conservatives who are in favor of dismantling public education by introducing voucher schemes are thinking that this is just one step towards their final game plan, right? So, you know, the, the failures of the centrist left here um, are just as much a part of this story as the sort of long, patient policy game that the far right has been pushing and playing in education. Um, and that's where we are now, right? The, this treaty has been broken uh, and it's like the Biden administration doesn't know it, right? It's, it's like they just woke up from a hundred year nap or maybe only a 20 year nap. And they think that we're still in this neoliberal consensus where, uh, you know, limited choice through charters and uh, standardized testing to enable a kind of um, performance management framework that might be used at, let's say, Alcoa in the manufacturing of aluminum, that that, that would apply to public education. And what we actually need is a radically progressive vision that is the equivalent on the left of what DeVos was proposing on the right. And I just want to throw in one more uh, brief point. We often get uh, asked as we we're talking about our book, A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, you know, what is the the vision of the future that that privatization advocates have? And you know, the answer is actually quite simple. It looks like higher ed, right? In higher education, it's up to you, the consumer, to decide how much you want to spend in order to invest in your human capital. And there is a robust loan, private loan market to support you. And you know, it's not a coincidence that we're talking to you in California tonight, where the dream of public higher ed, free public higher ed, really died. And you think about how Ronald Reagan launched his career off of sort of culture warring your institutions of public higher higher ed, how he made it about ca uh, campus protests and race, and how he, you know, systematically turned the public and the conservative public in particular against the idea of that, that people should be able to attend uh, higher educate public higher education for free that that should basically be an extension of k-12 so when we look at what's happening with k-12 today and you see these very aggressive privatization pushes underway but you also see this this really alarming kind of culture warring of k-12 we've gotten i think pretty used to by now of, of seeing the right at the state level use culture war arguments in order to justify defunding public higher ed. If you look at what's happened to state colleges in, in places like, like uh, Wisconsin, for example. But increasingly you're seeing these same sorts of arguments being extended to K-12, right? That that you you and the Republican Party shouldn't support funding K-12 because your kids will just be indoctrinated there, right? So think about all the attention that something like the 1619 project has gotten. Um, we see on the East Coast, for example, um, there at hyper local levels in New Hampshire, where you know people, small groups of people, get together to vote on on raising money to improve the school gym. Right now, they're getting ready to pass a version of what they call you know a divisive concepts bill that would ban teachers from talking about sexism or racism. Right, this this is meant to convey to the public that. Public education is basically unsafe. It's dead. It's uh, dangerous. It indoctrinates your kids, and therefore you should pull your kids out of it. You should support privatization legislation like school vouchers, and that frankly, you know, we shouldn't be in support of funding it. It's a very old argument, but it's come roaring back to life, um, largely because of the pandemic. So I think you have heard enough from Jack and I. So we're going to pass things along. And um, we tweeted, we actually included in the chat some links to things we've written, some more interviews that we've done, if you're interested in this. And thanks for having us.
Wow, that was great. Thanks a lot, Jack and Jen. Um, you know, I actually realized I didn't give you all a proper intro, so I want to do that right now because you guys deserve it, and it will also clear up some of the other things that we talked about just now. So Dr. Jack Schneider is an assistant professor of education at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where he leads the Beyond Test Scores Project. An award-winning scholar, his, broad, his work broadly explores the influence of history, culture, and rhetoric in education policy. The author of four books, including co-author of Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, which we just heard uh, Jennifer talking about. Uh, Dr. Schneider writes frequently about education outlets like the Atlantic, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and he is the co-founder of the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Education Assessment and the co-host of the Education Policy Podcast, Have You Heard? And the co-editor of History of Education Quarterly. So that's probably why he was so excited about talking about history. All right. So Dr. Jennifer Berkshire writes about education politics for the nation, the New Republic, the Baffler, the New York Times, and many other publications. As the creator and the co-host of the Education Policy Podcast, have you heard she teaches aspiring podcasters in the journalism program at Boston College and the Labor Studies program at UMass Amherst. Berkshire discovered her passion for storytelling while covering her series of bitter labor, ba labor battles that racked her native Midwest in the early 1990s. She is the author of More Worlds to Negotiate, John Dunlop and the Art of Problem Solving, and co-author of The Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door. And she is also a licensed public school teacher. So... That was the intro that I missed that I should have gotten to you before, which was definitely necessary. So now I'm going to bring it on over to Mark, uh, one of our other uh, Our Revolution East Bay board members, and he's going to introduce Mike Hutchinson, the OSU, uh, OUSD school board director. Uh, Mark, you unmuted and ready to go? I'm unmuted and ready to go and always give titles and qualifications before you bring the people on. That gives the audience uh, a little bit more attention. Yep. So uh, thank you, Jack Snyder and Jennifer Berkshire for your presentations. Marvelous. It was edifying and clarifying and strengthening. So thank you both. So it is a real pleasure to introduce our next speaker. He is a lifelong resident of Oakland. He knows Oakland's issues. He knows Oakland's communities. He knows Oakland. He went to UC Berkeley, my alma mater, and he is a champion for public education. And post-pandemic, if you hear calls for austerity, that means public education is on the chopping block. So we need champions, and he certainly is a champion. Uh, and I don't mind telling you all that the entire activist community was cheering when he was elected last year. He is Oakland Board of Education Director for District 5. It is a pleasure to bring forward Mike Hutchinson. Mike? Wow, <laughs> um, thank, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I, I, I think that might be a little bit much, um, but I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. And uh, like what was just mentioned, before I say anything else, I really, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces here and I really wanna thank um, both Our Revolution East Bay and BATS uh, for all of their support, especially in the last election. Uh, we were able to really put together this coalition that we're looking at here, and it brought us to victory. Um, and so um, before I, I launch into the history, um, I really do want to stress that I feel like we are winning now, and we are really starting to, to turn some of these corners. Um, but for everything that we just heard mentioned, Oakland has basically been ground zero on the West Coast for the privatization of public education. Um, we have been used as an experiment, as a petri dish for all of these national forces to come in and develop these policies. And for us in Oakland, it started in 2003 when our school board and school district was taken over by the state of California. If you look at some of the similarities for the cities really facing uh, the threats of school privatization, most of those cities do not have a democratically elected school board because that's part of the pattern that the forces of privatization use. So in Oakland, we were taken over by the state of California. And what the state of California did is they appointed a state administrator who had full authority over our school district. Our school board and our community were disenfranchised. That's when we started to experience school closures and a proliferation of charter schools in this period in Oakland from 2003 to 2009. If you remember back to some of the organizations that Anthony Cody mentioned before, the Broad Foundation appointed 
three of our four state administrators. So these were outside of Oakland administrators who were trained at the Broad Administrator Academy and were brought to Oakland to implement certain policies. And that's what they did. So we saw our neighborhood schools closed. We saw the elimination of curriculum. We saw almost the complete elimination of adult ed and our child development centers. And our district was decimated because outside forces were put in control. Then as we started to regain local control in 2009 is when nationally charter schools and privatization really became a movement about privatization. And like Anthony mentioned at the start, one of the components of school privatization is the creation of AstroTurf organizations. And what we experienced in Oakland as our school board began to regain local control is four billionaires used their resources to leverage control and policy decisions. We had three national billionaires, Eli Broad, the Walton Family Foundation, and Bill Gates. And we had our local billionaire, the Rogers Foundation, who formed an organization called GO, Great Oakland Public Schools. And they started getting very active in electoral politics. They also formed another organization called the Oakland Public Education Fund. To this day, the Oakland Public Education Fund is a fiscal sponsor of OUSD, of our school district. Every charitable contribution that our school district gets is laundered through the Ed Fund first, where they take at least 7% off the top. The other thing that started to happen is um, we started to eliminate whole departments in our school district and started to rely on either outside consultants to provide those services, another big component of privatization, or what was called interns from the certain organizations that had a political agenda. Again, the Oakland Public Education Fund. There's another organization called Education Pioneers, which is an offshoot of the Broad Foundation. We still have a lot of those people working in our school district, running programs and providing key services. And so again, our district was, was taken over by privatization. And we need to understand what that means. That means there are private organizations coming in and extracting a profit margin out of our public education dollars. That is what it means, just like private prisons as compared to prisons that the state runs. It is also other folks can come in and extract profit off of our communities at the expense of our public education system. And again, it replicates the colonial model all over again, which is what we've experienced in Oakland time and time again, where we have lost local control and outsiders have come in and dictated to us. And in the end, we've wound up with even less. And so at a certain point, many of us started to see something was going on and it sparked something. For me, at this time in 2011, 2012 school year, I was still working in the schools in Oakland. The two schools that I had worked at for 10 years were under threat to be closed that year. The one in particular that I was at was Santa Fe Elementary. And I know most people might not know the, the geography of Oakland, but Santa Fe Elementary is three blocks away from the founding intersection of the Black Panther Party. That is a very, very important school to the community. It literally birthed the Black Panther Party that spread around the world. That school was slated for closure and we really organized that year to try to fight this off. That's when I became politicized to our schools being under attack in this sort of way. And there were five schools slated for closure that year. We got to the point late in that school year where we had a thousand community members showing up at school board meetings, but still our school board that had been bought and paid for by Go Public Schools and funded by these outside billionaires insisted on closing our schools. In the end, at the end of 2012, when they voted to close our five schools, the community led by one parent held a 17 day occupation and sit in at one of those five schools at Lakeview Elementary. 
And that's what really sparked us here in Oakland. So for me, I wound up running for school board that year. I didn't win and I didn't win four years later, but I did win last year finally in my third attempt. After a million dollars combined being spent against me by these same billionaires in Oakland School Board District 5. But kind of the other thing that happened for us here is that really started us organizing. I work with youth. I was never an organizer before. Um, and this really got us into organizing and realizing that we had to do something to fight back and to save our neighborhood schools, to save our school system. I was really lucky that soon after the election in 2012, uh, I was able to meet G2 Brown out of Chicago. And G2 Brown invited us in Oakland to testify with 30 cities at the Department of Education in January of 2013 at Obama's Department of Education with Arnie Duncan. And we were testifying on the damage done to all of our cities by school closures and charter schools. Because what had happened during the state takeover in Oakland, the proliferation of charter schools had been so extreme that Oakland, since about 2007, has had the highest rate of charter schools in the state of California. We still now are at just about 30% charter schools. And in our city, um, we kind of have a freeway dividing our city. There's the hills and the flatlands. 40 of the 44 charter schools that we have in Oakland are below the freeway in the flatlands and in low income communities of color. And so we know if these charter schools and if privatization was providing better academic outcomes, our privileged families in the hills would be demanding those schools be placed in their neighborhoods. Instead, the opposite has happened. Those communities have been able to fight off school privatization and they've only been put in low income communities of color. That was what we organized around nationally to testify at the Department of Education about in 2013. That was the weekend that we collectively formed the Journey for Justice National Alliance. And since that day, we have also been working nationally and collectively to push these issues forward. So this hasn't just been an issue in Oakland, California. This has been an issue in Chicago, in New York, in New Orleans, in Detroit, across this country, particularly in the cities we used to refer to as the chocolate cities. Because just like any other destructive policy, it is directed at our communities first. And so we have done an amazing job of creating something out of nothing when it comes to organizing against billionaires and these policies. And so let's not forget that really the charter school policies and most of these policies of privatization come directly out of ALEC, just like a lot of other policies, just like stand your ground. These are the folks who have always had it out for our communities, who have never wanted us to be educated. So through the Journey for Justice National Alliance, we've worked really hard to bring on other leading uh, national uh, civil rights and black led organizations. So nationally, the NAACP has called for a moratorium on school privatization because of our work together. And even though in Oakland, we have a branch of the NAACP that is out of alignment with the national and is very problematic when it comes to school privatization, nationally, the NAACP has become a strong ally. Also, the Movement for Black Lives has taken uh, policy positions against school privatization and charter schools. And now we're excited here in Oakland because my victory in this last election really means that we have turned the corner. I am the first school board member to be elected since the state takeover in 2003 with an explicit platform to counter these policies that have been inflicted upon our community. And things are moving quickly now. We beat Bloomberg head to head. We beat New Schools Venture Fund, a billionaire slush fund that's based in Oakland. And we beat the charter schools. And so now our work that we're looking to do here in Oakland, and it's an open question, is how do you restore community control to a district that has been taken over? 
you know, it always happens to Oakland first. So when we were taken over in 2003, a lot of what the privatizers learned in Oakland, they then implemented after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. It was based on what they had learned in Oakland. But now we don't have any place to look and say, okay, now how do we restore local control? How do we go about closing the charter schools now that we pass the new state law, Assembly Bill 1505, that gives us tools to close charter schools and deny them? How do we go about doing that? In a city like Oakland, where 30% of our schools are charter schools, we can't say tomorrow we're closing them all. How do we root out $80 million worth of consultants from our district? How do we build up our internal capacity again? How do we restore the trust that's been broken with the community having gone through these experiences? So this is a hopeful time, I think, for Oakland, and I want to spread this word out from Oakland. I really appreciate the history that we heard today and the work of Anthony Cody and a lot of other folks that I was able to use when I first got into this. But now we are kind of at the doorsteps for turning a new corner. How do we go about ensuring that we have high quality public schools in all of our neighborhoods? How do we guarantee that we are resourcing our community schools the way our communities deserve to be resourced? How are we holding our elected officials accountable? And how are we forcing them to finally act in our self-interest and not the interest of the billionaires who fund many of them? So I think it's hopeful. And I think if we take this history, if we take our strong uh, progressive values and we partner it with a deep belief in the community and the value of us working collectively to raise all of our ships, it is exciting going forward. And my last little pitch that I'm gonna be talking about for the next year, one of the things we always worried about for transformational change in education was really to bring about that change, you kind of had to destroy the old system first. And for me personally, I, I didn't want to destroy public education in Oakland. That was always a, a worry. Well, during this last year, our schools have been shut down. They've been destroyed. And now for schools like Oakland, we have one-time COVID relief dollars raining out of the sky. How do we use these one-time relief dollars now to fund transformational change over the next three years to set up the kind of schools we want going forward? We have a competitive advantage against these charter schools now because of these COVID relief dollars. And so this is a time I'm making a call. I see there's elected officials on here and I know there's other folks in Oakland. We are hijacking the strategic plan in Oakland and I'm on the budget and finance committee. This is now an opportunity that we didn't know would be here. Given the history that we've just heard with these one time dollars, we have this opportunity now. So how do we build off of this history and really build in this change and this correction that we've needed for so long? So thank you. I'm going to stop speaking because I'm going to start giving too much rah-rah. Um, but I really appreciate being here. And please, once you have this history and some of this, spread it to your community. And more than anything, we need folks being engaged. Be engaged at your local school, with your local school board, with your city government, with your state government. The reason so much of this happened in Oakland is because we let it happen as a community. And we need to make sure that we hold a line and never let those things happen again. So thank you for, for letting me talk for a little bit today. And, and again, I appreciate the support and we got a big four years here in Oakland. That was great, thanks Mike. <clears throat> All right, so now we've just completed the speaking portion of the town hall and we're gonna go over to the Q&A portion of the town hall. So if any of the Q&A panelists or the board have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll ask you for you in the chat. Really, no questions? Oh, there's Gail, cool. All right, Gail, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. This was so, so very, very interesting. I, I appreciate all the speakers and OR and uh, um, I forget the name, Badass uh, Teachers the group that uh, co-sponsored this. Um, 
So my, my question, some of the things that really, really resonated, I think all of it resonated, but um, in particular, the aspect that I think Jennifer and Jack talked about in terms of how our schools are, are preparing um, students for work, workforce preparation rather than to learn and to appreciate and to tap into their curiosity and uh, creativity and all those wonderful things that education should be. Um, it's we're preparing them for, or they're trying to get us to prepare them for the workplace. Um, I'm, I'm a Richmond City Council member, a former mayor of Richmond, and um, you know we, we as a city council gave money to our schools to help schools from closing. And, um, you know, but I also have a little a bit of experience as a, um, as a public education uh, teacher, not a whole lot, but uh, I found, you know, the high state testing and um, the lack of funding and all that to be just really, really hard to deal with because it really wasn't helping the students. So, um, and I do see this he heavy competition and workforce preparation as being a real problem. And it's, I, the question is, you know, we, it seems like so many of the aspects of our society um, intersect and they're, they intersect by way of hierarchical relations, you know, like work and production. Um, it's mirrored in our schools uh, because there's hierarchies between administrators and teachers, teachers and students, students and other students. And um, that corresponds to the boss worker relationship. And, in, and, and indeed, we're preparing students to play the play a role in that hierarchy. Um, and, uh, you know, they become alienated just as workers become alienated. So I, I've heard so many solutions, which are really good, like more funding, stopping the charter school expansion, stopping high stick high stakes teaching, um, more desegregation, teacher support, etc. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask about um, that I think is an overlap as well in terms of this hierarchy and in terms of another area of our society, and that's the military. Um, could someone uh, talk about military recruiting in our schools and how we can how we can stop that. And I know there's been organizing, I've been involved a little bit in Richmond with uh, us trying to stop that. And where is it at? I know it's an opt out, parents have to opt out of having their kids uh, names and uh, information go to the military so they can um, have that information. Is there any advancement to stop that? Um, that opt out and just um, eliminate that uh, information giving to the military from the schools? Um, and also, um, has there been any advancement of stopping military recruiters to come onto school campuses in general? Yeah, so I guess that would be for Anthony and Jennifer. Any of you had any thoughts? I wasn't meant, I, I can, that was actually the yeah. first campaign I ever did as a high school student uh, in Oakland was to fight against the, uh, the school district from giving our contact info to military recruiters. Um, and so in, in a real sense, there are multiple things that school boards can do, and it's really a school board choice. Um, so the school board does not have to provide contact information to the military. They can take a vote and decide whether they want to do that or, or not. Um, there, you, it's very hard to uh, limit military recruiters access to the schools because there are families that want that, like they want access to colleges, but you can make sure there's not things like teachers giving extra credit to attend uh, sessions with military recruiters. Um, but these decisions have to come from a school board and the school board can set any policy that they want around that. And that should be the overarching um, policy. And I would just say, as especially now that I have to be concerned as a, as a school board director, instead of just what I think, um, you know, there still are um, large segments of our community that see the military um, as a, opportunity for a future also. And so I think when we're when we're looking at this, um, 
we should be really explicit that if we're looking at eliminating something, that we are creating a better option to go with it. You know, uh, Malcolm talked about the clean glass of water. I really believe in that. And so if we're looking at um, doing something with military recruiters, then let's make sure that we have much better uh, internships, career technical training, and college access to balance it out then. But a school board can make any of those decisions. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see here. Uh, Anthony or Jennifer, did you have any thoughts or we can go on to the next question? Okay, uh, Lamar, I guess you can, I guess you're the next one up with your hand raised. So go ahead and uh, ask your question. Well, I was paying attention. I believe it was Ben. <laughs> so I can go after Ben. I don't want to get in line. Yeah, sorry, sorry, on my screen, it was showing you, Nick. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Okay, Lamar, I'm, you know, I'm honored to, uh, to, 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 to tee you up, I guess. But, uh, you know, I'm honored to be here with you and see you here. Uh, Mike Hudson, good to see you, buddy. Congratulations. Um, you know, you pulled it off. Really proud of you. And hi, Gail. Wonderful. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, this has really been an amazing uh, panel. I wasn't quite sure what, um, you know, what to expect, right? Uh, and honestly, I want to say that the the speakers have definitely reframed my personal conception of public education. Um, I mean, definitely, because, you know, my mother is a school teacher and has been, you know, most of my life. Um, and she has a reading system. She um, sells the school districts and helps helps black kids get out of out of the um, special ed track into prison. Um, I myself was pulled out of uh, public schools when it was they were very racist to me. So I went to Black Panther school uh, when I was a kid, and then was homeschooled for many years. Um, you know, so I, I have a really just a, I have a deep I have a multi leveled sort of um, conception and opinion. Uh, of the education system. And it's not without my own personal critiques. Um, but I really, I see it in a new light now, I wanna tell you. Um, and I'm really, I'm optimistic for articulating a new vision for it. And as the author said, there's a, there's a we need to rearticulate the purpose of education, right? To, to create a cohesive society. And I'm thinking about how, how we recently had this, you know, the, right now in this country, we're at loggerheads. Uh, with the, the, the quote unquote right and the quote unquote left um, at loggerheads, right? Where, you know, civil war talk is in the media all the time. It seems like now more than ever, we need that vision um, of public schools as a place to come together and learn to live with each other. Now, um, my question is, is, is more is related to the, the Biden um, infrastructure funds that were mentioned. Um, I'm, I don't know enough about it, but I'm wondering if the capital improvements um, to physical, to government buildings, could that be used to channel resources into these schools um, that are so depleted and so distressingly bankrupt um, that it makes parents want to have choice, right? And if we can tie job creation, economic development to these new cells um, of opportunity represented by these these community centers, what schools are, right? These these schools, um, it seems like we could have something and build from there. Um, you know, that's just my thoughts. But is are there? Do you, does anyone know about the 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 direction of the funding for the public for the public um, dollars? So um, so that the infrastructure money is absolutely uh, you can absolutely be used for capital improvements. And one of the things that's been so interesting is that the you know, the Biden folks are pouring an immense amount of money into public education, but also into really like a kind of poverty relief effort that we haven't seen in generations that they are they're doing something that we have not done or we we had really sort of taken off the table which is that you the idea that you can make people less poor by giving them money directly and so the it's not just that we have this opportunity to improve the schools but we have the opportunity to really like make people's lives better and the thing that concerns me is that the when it comes to schools the biden folks 
they don't really seem to have an explanation as to the why behind any of this. So, for example, in their budget that they released at the end of the week, um, they announced, you know, we're going to give even more money to Title I schools, which will include most of the schools in Oakland. And But they can't really say, like, well, well why are we doing this, right? So far, it's still hung up on the Obama era explanations. Well, it's going to improve test scores. You know, well, it's going to, uh, th this is preparation for workforce. So I, you know, it's funny because as Ben, as you were talking, even though I had my camera off, I was nodding away because even though Jack and I wrote this book that is actually quite grim, I feel like you do that, that we are in this moment where because this kind of uh, treaty that Jack was describing has broken down, and even though there are, you know, if you look at a community like o Oakland, where there are all these deep pocketed forces that have a very particular vision, I think there's enough space between what people on the ground want parents, students, and what's being offered by the people with all the money that we can build some alliances and and really like demand something bigger, right? Because the like at the end of the day, there as Mike was saying, we might not have the answer for what transformational change looks like, but there's nobody in Oakland who says that my vision of a great school is one that raises my son or daughter's math and English test scores. That's all I care about. That That's just, that's too narrow. And so we have an opportunity to kind of blow that up. Anthony, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, but that's all I have. Well, well, thank you for that. That was amazing, amazing comment. And I'd love to stay in touch and, um, you know, and do my part to help articulate this future. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, I'd like to also hear your thoughts on that too, possibly. No, I, 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 I agree. I think, uh, you know, with, with, these, with these being one-time dollars, it gives us the opportunity to think, it's not even outside of the box, outside of the box that they had us in because these are dollars that are outside of our normal budget process. So this is our time to think about some of these things. Like for example, in the infrastructure bill, there's language specifically about taking care of uh, lead in the water and lead in pipes. In Oakland, we're definitely going to make a play as a school district to use that for our schools. And so I think there's these opportunities. I would love for us to see if there's even some regional opportunities, because we also have a new city council in Oakland now that might be more willing to have. So I, I think these are the things that we need to figure out and look into. There are, so let me, as a, as a blanket statement, there are very few strings attached to these dollars right now. And um, the strings might appear in the future and there's gonna be probably still more money coming but especially with a little uh, budget creativity, there are very few strings and these are almost unrestricted dollars. And what I, what I would add, and I think, I think both Mike and Jennifer have kind of uh, addressed this partly, but up until this budget, um, these, these fund, this, this new funding, the discretionary funding that's come along has always come, has been coming from these philanthropies for a long time. And that, you know, when you have a district like Oakland that's starved for funding, you can come along with a million or two, $2 million, which really isn't a very large amount of money um, relative to Oakland's bu annual budget. And you can steer the whole the whole ship with with that small amount of discretionary funding. So, you know, what, with with the arrival of, of a lot more of this discretionary funding, it sort of demands involvement. It demands a really heightened level of involvement of community involvement so that it isn't wasted on more test preparation and learning loss compensation programs in, in the summer or something like that. You know, we need to, we need to really elevate the, uh, the solutions that are, you know, that are community driven, that are, 
that are developed by local, you know, by local educators and local community leaders. Um, and that's where it's really important that we have groups like Journey for Justice on the ground capable of articulating what those programs should look like, what community, you know, and going back to the, you know, it's great that the Black Panther schools were mentioned, you know, going back to the roots of liberation education um, and seeing how we can, we can bring that up from the grassroots as sort of an alternative vision to all of this uh, workforce preparation uh, mindset, test score mindset programming. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right, Lamar, now you're up. Hola. <laughs> so, uh, so, well, thank you, everybody. And thank you for having little old me all the way from Antioch. Uh, so my question, you know, um, as some of you uh, talked, I was, uh, I was um, very, very impressed, but I was, I was, some of what was being said reminded me of uh, Naomi Klein's uh, book, The, uh, the Shock Doctrine. And uh, it was uh, uh, it, it was fascinating because, of course, as I'm hearing Mike talk about what happened in Oakland, you know, uh, my first job out of graduate school was as a substitute teacher in Washington D.C. under Michelle Reed, uh, and so I literally watched the devastation and the exploitation of, uh, to your point, my, you know, places that were once called Chocolate City. Uh, literally, this has happened everywhere. Uh, New Orleans has been taken over by charter schools. Washington, D.C. has been taken over by charter schools. Oakland is being taken over by charter schools and so on and so on. And literally cities that used to be uh, majority black cities. And so, but as I thought about the, the, the premise or the theory that uh, Naomi Klein puts on her book, is something happened that would have allowed the exploitation of this created a vacuum or there was a vacuum that wasn't being filled. And the disparities that are current today, whether it's here in Antioch in our public schools with the black children in Oakland, I'm sure, uh, and everywhere else didn't happen as a result of charter schools, didn't happen as a result of vouchers and privatization, have always existed. And, and uh, I am by no stretch of the imagination any uh, charter school advocate by no stretch. I've been a strong public school uh, supporter. Uh, but that vacuum has created the environment. Our lack or our inability to deal with those disparities has created these moments. And we're gonna continue to be in this cycle. You know, all this money that comes from the federal government, we start to talk about redesigning this, that, and the third. If we don't really come to grips with how we really deal with the fact, here in Antioch, we have two zip codes. One is the wealthiest in East Contra Costa County, second to Discovery Bay, and one is the poorest, uh, one of the poorest in our county. The wealthiest is where the majority of Black people live, and yet the outcomes, the academic outcomes in our public schools in this wealthy zip code are horrendous, <laughs> are absolutely horrendous. So we, you know, we got to deal with those structural inequities, those, those challenges, and so I'm curious to get, you know, our panelists take on on, uh, on, uh, on, on how we deal with some of these realities. I think that one of the, one of the things that the pandemic really did was force people to acknowledge that those kinds of disparities not only exist, but that they have a profound effect on what happens in school. Suddenly we could all see what out of school looked like. And the whole, I mean, I'm amazed that you worked in DC with Michelle Ree because she was really kind of the poster person for the idea that you didn't need to do anything about the disparities outside of schools because they could be remedied inside the schools. That if you just got the teachers who were willing to work hard enough and believe hard enough, um, and that was going to require a lot of change, right? Like they couldn't have unions anymore because the unions just protected the bad teachers and you needed to get away. You needed to cut through all of this red tape. And so like that vision appealed to a lot of people and it appealed to a lot of people who 
have a lot of people with power and money, right? Because it means like if we really could lift kids up out of poverty without having to make any kind of structural change, wouldn't that be so great? If you didn't have to pay higher taxes, if you got to stay in your nice zip code, but no one ever had to give anything up. So now I think we're at this point where though the Michelle Rees are really gone, right? Like it's it, one of my sort of, one of the points that I always think about is that her group, Students First, no longer exist. It was taken over by another group that now advocates for private school vouchers, right? Like what a, what a telling example of the, the sort of ed reform trajectory. But so I think this is what Jack and I were getting at when we talked about the Biden administration as being kind of stuck in the Rip Van Winkle education reform um, period that they're still acting as though, even though outside of education, they're acknowledging that we can't help families in poverty unless we do something directly about the fact that they're in poverty. But when it comes to education, they're still talking about schools as though they're, that somehow they're gonna, um, that if we just uh, raise student test scores and hold teachers accountable for student test scores, that's gonna be the thing that does it. I feel like there's an opportunity that's really opened up here, but we have exactly the challenge that Lamar was pointing to, which is that these vast disparities existed long before things like school privatization. That in many cases in these communities, the privatization has been kind of imposed on top of the disparities. And so you have these bitter battles playing out where Inevitably, it's the teachers' unions or people who are, are perceived as the status quo end up, they almost sound as though they're saying that the disparities are okay, we just don't like your particular remedy, right? And so I think like what's inspiring about this and hearing Lamar's story and, and Ben's story is that there's exhaustion with the set of solutions while everyone's still acknowledging that like if we don't figure out how to deal with these disparities, like we're, you know, like this, this is an explosive situation. We have to come up with something. I don't have the answer. That's why I'm so glad to be among brilliant people like yourselves and I'll mute myself now. I think just the other thing to throw and thank you for, I always forget at the start to say, and I need to be better about it. Our schools have never uh, done as well as they should or they could. And, and that's just a given, um, especially in our communities. But we also have to recognize that over time, our schools are doing better. And the other trap with this is um, a lot of these statements about our schools not doing well or not performing are based on standardized testing. And um, our students are always going to fail racist tests. That's how they're designed. And in Oakland, as a district, we have roughly a third of our students or 35% of our students testing proficient across the whole district. For African-American students, it barely reaches double digits. And so it is two things together. It is our schools aren't serving us well enough, but we also have to have the right tools to evaluate our schools and make those decisions going forward. And so what I, for me personally, what I, I try to, uh, to pick the third way. I really believe that if we set up a system where the community feels like they are empowered to make decisions for their school site, we, we, can, we can go around a lot of these things and the community knows what works, what we need to do. Um, it is a question of having that system in place and then making sure that we are fully resourcing those decisions that the community um, is making. But I know that most people, given a choice of everything being equal, would want to walk to their neighborhood public school. It's our job to make those conditions equal so they will make those choices. And if I could just build on that a bit, I think part of the challenge is to create um, another way of looking at learning, because it's not enough just to say standardized tests are racist, which they are. We have to create a competing and compelling vision of how do we, I don't, I don't want to use the word measure, but how do we recognize 
learning? How do we celebrate learning in our, in our schools? How do we, you know, and there are schools that have um, done really great work with, with portfolios and um, students and students kind of developing uh, projects that, that really represent their learning. Um, there's a, there's a New York um, performance consortium schools that, that have, been opting out of the regents exams for for quite a while now um, that have really shown how you can do this with a faculty that comes together and really works with the students closely to to chart their own paths to some extent in terms of how are they going to conceptualize their education and um i think you know that that's something we 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 might think about when we look at um, what some of this funding might might be used for, but but it's really uh, it's really challenging. Um, I think part of the problem that with the paradigm that we're in <clears throat> is we've had this mindset that says schools should fix poverty, and then schools are blamed for not fixing poverty, and the premise was was flawed to begin with. You don't fix poverty by you know by getting kids to pass tests kids who are living in impoverished neighborhoods and impoverished communities have a fundamental problem of lack of identifying with the aspirations and the and the measurements because they haven't succeeded with them and to maintain a, a sense of self-identity i think it's not necessarily healthy for those kids to to buy in completely to these definitions of of excellence so we we as an you know there's a uh, uh, saying, you know, we, we don't want to change the student to match the test. How can we change our educational system so it lifts up our students and reflects their culture and reflects their aspirations? It's, it's not a, not a, it's a lot harder to do than it is to, to just say, why don't you go do that? But uh, <laughs> that's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the magnitude of the task we have. Great. Yeah, actually, I think Posse Salberg said something like that, where he said, you know, in America, we get the student prepared for the school, but in Finland, we prepare the school for the student. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, check out the next question from Ellie. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And thank you to the amazing panelists. Um, I'm very nerdy and have too many notes on what folks said. And I really appreciate uh, being stimulated in that way. Um, and so for folks that might not know, my name is Ellie Householder. I'm the school board president for the Antioch Unified School District. I'm the youngest person ever elected in Antioch, thanks in no small part to our revolution um, and their support in me. Whereas the charter schools were offering me tens of thousands of dollars, our revolution came and they're like, we'll will knock on doors for you. Um, and obviously it worked out for the better. So this is intersecting quite a few places for me. Um, and so uh, the one thing that I wanna ask, and I wanna ask all the panelists the same question, um, and Anthony, Mr. Cody, you kind of made me think of it, of this like, well, it's not enough to just say these tests are racist, what are we gonna do about it? And I'm a firm believer in what Angela Glover Blackwell calls radical imagination. Um, and so in that spirit, I'm curious if you had a magic wand, money's not an option, like there are no barriers or, or kind of parameters to implementing your idea, what's the one thing you would do for public education that addresses either one of the things that you talked about or mentioned or, or, or anything else? Because there's a lot to unpack, but if you could do anything, what would that be? Well, I, I would start by saying, um, you know, I'd look at the work of uh, Deborah Meyer with uh, democratizing schools, um, thinking about, um, you know, how you how you conceptualize what what learning looks like, making making learning visible, and create processes where that includes community members 
and reflects community values and elevates learning so that it's visible to the community, I think that goes a long way to building ownership of public schools by the community. So that, that would be my suggestion. I, um, Jack had to go put his daughter to bed. I wish he was here because he actually has um, a side hustle. He runs um, a group in Massachusetts that's uh, devoted to coming up with a measure of school performance that more accurately reflects what teachers, students, and the community care about. And so, because I, I do feel like that is such a big part of our problem that we're stuck in this framework and that it makes everybody unhappy. And so what if there was a way for Oakland to define what it cares about and what the, you know, like, what does it mean to be a, a successful school and a successful student? And so that I would, I would really hold that up. I'm going to put a plug uh, for his book, A Better Measure in the in the chat because i i do feel like the one of the problems we have you know it's so cool to hear about uh uh progressives being elected to school boards and then you know i interview them for my writing on my podcast and i hear their frustration that they come in and the you know the goal is to really like shake things up and they realize they're stuck within this you know kind of like ancient framework not just about test scores but about you know like what it is a school board does and so what if we could be a little bit bolder and bigger about the the kinds of demands we were making and what you guys like wouldn't that make your jobs more exciting mike and ellie well I'm, my, mine's pretty exciting so i i kind of came in with a plan i think um so i i would say you know um it really matters what the specific issues in antioch are right now you know, for us in Oakland, our, our real issue has been instability. So just to bring some stability and some continuity to our school sites and to our district is a really, really big thing after 20 years of this coming at us. I also, uh, in California, we have um, good laws about school site councils. I'm also in a big believer in fully empowering school site councils to make these school site decisions. Um, you know, another thing we did this year is we put in a waiver to this asking for a waiver from the state for Prop 39 offers. So this year we had no Prop 39 offers. We gave no new leases to charter schools under Prop 39. Um, so I think there's a there's a whole lot we could. So remember, Oakland and Antioch are not that far away. Let's let's talk sometime. But I think this is there is now a wave of new elected school board members across California. And I am, uh, this is kind of out of this topic, <laughs> but I'm a real believer in that we've been, uh, we've had failed leadership across the board for 20 years, um, especially here in Oakland, uh, elected officials, union leadership, and the nonprofit sector. I really believe that it's going to take a natural turnover in leadership before we can really bring some of these solutions forward. So I think now's the time for, for some of us newly elected folks to, uh, uh, to, to have a new path going forward. So I would say, you know, in Antioch, you guys can propose whatever you want to propose as a school board. And when it comes to testing and evaluations, as long as you're not setting yourselves up to get dinged from the state or the feds, you have a lot of leeway in what you actually set up locally. You know, that's why education's great also, where it is one of the things where we do have local decision-making power if we choose to really implement it. Awesome. Uh, was it, did you have follow up, Ellie, or? Uh, no, just thank you all. I guess I, I actually did want to say too, another reason why this is actually super interesting for me is I think I might be the person on the call who's the, maybe the closest to having graduated high school. And so as a child of no child left behind, I'm a product of those failed policies. And so these conversations um, give me hope, but I do just want to say, you know, they're there are kids who are in school right now, you know, and just always keeping that as the, as the frame. So thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, definitely we have to always keep the next generation 
in our mind when we're when we're dealing with all these legislation, which I wish the previous generation would have done, but you know, say la vie. Um, so the next question is going to come from one of our board members, Stephen. Steve or coach is good, Jake. Yeah, mom calls me Stephen once more. Um, and my my students call me Coach Finch. Uh, you guys call me Finch, whatever it is. Mike, I was I had goosebumps. So I was an investigative journalist, uh, mostly in the health and medical field for about 15 years before I became a teacher. Um, did my credential program at night while I taught at Cole Middle School, uh, right between Lower Bottoms and Acorn. Uh, school had no sports program, no newspaper, no, I uh, had just eliminated its art and music program so they could have double math and double English. So they took what was engaging to a kinesthetic, um, artistic, culturally relevant education and, and dumped it out the window to try to hit this. And so what I'm hearing, what has been wonderful to me is hear about this paradigm shift and the way we think and the gatekeeping for what is success uh, to get into school or to continue your career, uh, continue your academics or your learning. I would say learning in the way that is right and how you want to do it. Um, I will say this, you know, for me on site councils and I've been involved in other things and seeing, you know, how much you guys are aware of how much there are pools of money that are earmarked and to have this opportunity also got me got really pricked my ears up because um we had 40 foot cyclone fencing it looked and felt like a prison they would lock the doors when i was outside i got my pe credential be out there um we had a we had a football and a couple of hula hoops that was the you know other than the stuff that i would buy for every unit um but I will say this, um, right now as, a, as an itinerant adapted PE teacher in special education, I'm at 15 school sites um, around Contra Costa County, uh, Antioch, I'm at Turner, I'm out in Oakley, I'm all out that area and I'm all the way out through the privileged schools, uh, Rendell Lafayette and Walnut Creek. And the difference uh, I see in where it's maybe an opportunity, every time I got to school, I said, we don't wanna come to this school, coach, it's, it's Bootsy. Right. It was all it was I was in the age of hyphy my first year in Bootsy. And that was what, what, what our facilities and they really were shoddy. You didn't have to pay me. We had dedicated teachers. You have to pay me more, but you might provide a printer that worked. You might not make me have to buy my own printer ink and my own paper. Uh, that facility, that school site would be someplace that I was proud to come to. Now, I'm a middle school kid. I'm not going to admit that I like my school. Right. But. But something that is not falling down, something where it's not too hot in my class, where my Maslow needs are met uh, at my school as a place where I, I, I've got a place to learn. Uh, you know, it'd be great, whatever the recipe we come up to, to develop critical, we, what we value is to develop critical thinking skills, uh, culturally relevant education uh, and um, esteem around wanting to learn like lifelong learners right you, we can teach you an individual piece of knowledge um or skill um, and we're going to need to do that so you can build on the stuff that's going to be asked of you later on if you want to go to college and other things as well too but you know just build these lifelong learners and without the engagement the initial engagement of walking through that gate and feeling like this is a place i want to be so i'm going to throw it out there that right now and as a health and medical journalist and someone doing this master's program around the reopening of schools in COVID right now. There's social equity issues around crumbling infrastructure. It's all about airflow in those classrooms. Now you try to throw 30 students three feet away from each other in a, in a classroom where I might shut the door now because I'm more worried about students eloping or safety or security. Might not, I might have windows that are fixed and not opening or it's too cold or too hot to arrange that. Now I'm gonna expose those students to each other's, you know, to the um, potential more viral load because of this. As well, so with that staff and students being another equity issue, that's facilities. So these facilities were theoretically open. I mean, it's butts and seats. That's how we're supposed to pay for our schools, right? You got more students, you should have more money. And it, and it doesn't, like, you know, even when you, you should have that, Lamar's talking about, you should have it, you don't quite get there. So my thoughts, and I, is for anybody who wants to jump on it, is that it's, we can envision all these other things, but where we can hit locally is we can create school sites that are, uh, places, environments that are conducive to learning and teaching, where a teacher has the resources they need to creatively provide a great education and start create critical thinkers, and where students don't feel 
you know, unsafe and disheartened just by being on the campus. I'm not sure that's a question, but my question is, I, like my, my specific question would be to anyone. So I've got, how do we uh, maybe, and right now in facilities, I'm really concerned about school, about people going back to school in some of our older schools and our more crumbly schools that um, where CDC and who will tell you that it's possible for us to go back safely, it's possible. But then they'll give you all these airflow studies that you're supposed to be measuring and monitoring with HEPA filters to make sure. Now I know my county facility, my county folks are working really hard to ventilate as much as possible, but you know, in the marginalized communities, it's gonna be worse, right? You know, it's gonna be that way. And so we're gonna have all these little asymptomatic carriers, again, passing their exposure to this pandemic, again, more frequently in marginalized communities to their families and the other areas. So this is a big deal around me facilities as well. What, what do we do? What do we do about that? That's a sort of an immediate concern and longer picture. If you got these, they got this money, Mike, and it's not, it's not earmarked. Ooh. Well, I, I want to jump in. So as a, as a side note, uh, Cole middle school is closed and has been closed for over a decade. And, um, you know, in that part of Oakland and West Oakland there has been uh, one of the neighborhoods very impacted by these outside forces coming in. And so uh, Cole has never been our prettiest school, at least during my lifetime, but um, it reached a point where it was being done intentionally. Our schools were intentionally being kept in a state of disrepair to make it easier to close them, to move those properties to developers and charter schools. That's what the end game always was in Oakland, was the properties. That was the real profit profit that, that folks were looking for. So I really think that this was intentionally done. I agree with you. I have been pitching a plan for next year, a recovery year, to whatever, throw $40 million out of these one-time relief dollars, put a coat of paint on it, make sure we have extra adults, and make our facilities look the way that they need to look. I really believe that a, a lot of that is, is just will and intention um, to make that happen. Now, I'm going to dodge the whole COVID reopening because it, it's a mess and we're in this pandemic. And um, we, we do need to be able to provide in-person instruction. But I'm really, really worried on how we get from where we are right now with our schools being shut down for over a year to being able to provide it in a real way in the fall. Um, but we do have these one-time dollars to be able to do it. And in terms, in Oakland, we have a facilities bond now of almost 800 million. So we're actually looking at a billion extra dollars to be able to fund these things. Um, and, and for our facilities, it has been looked into. The problem is about 30% of our facilities are older and can't accommodate the MERV 16 filters. And so this is gonna be some open questions and, and Oakland, so here's, here's the other thing and then I'm gonna mute again. Um, the one good thing about these one-time dollars is these one-time dollars are being targeted. And so this could be looked at as equity dollars. So for Oakland, we are getting over 10 times as much relief dollars per student as Piedmont. Uh, the city we surround with a lot of privilege. And so we actually have, for the first time, a competitive advantage. From It's almost like these dollars are the full funding of Title I and I, IDEA that should have always happened. And so uh, certain districts, Oakland, Richmond, I'm sure even Antioch, are getting more dollars than other cities are. So we should use these dollars and, and have a, a targeted plan to spend these dollars to fund equity, since that's why we're receiving these dollars. Um, and then the, the cautionary side is we just don't have these things in place in our districts. And to bring this back to privatization, charter schools have been able to get money directly through uh, uh, the small business loans and all of these other dollars. So even though charter schools are getting relief dollars directly, there is still an effort from privatizers to also tap into these dollars that we're getting in our public education system. So we also need to be on guard that they're not able to siphon off any of our dollars or as few dollars as we can possibly allow. 
Thank you. And then I will say my thing out there by you and Ellie and, and Lamar is uh, Pittsburgh High. I know a lot of educators there and uh, there's just a different vibe. Now they've had their problems, but that's been staffing and administrative and principals and other things and their issues that are ongoing. But the site is dynamic and it's a, it's a, there's a, just a different feel to the way those students just walk down the hallway and that lights people up and they, uh, I just see, I see learning and I, I really feel it there. So, you know, and even if, it, you know, you can't make a brand new school everywhere, but like Mike, yeah, coat of paint, um, uh, the, the, the resources and facilities that you need to print paper and, and uh, you know, have access to, to, you know, environmentally right temperature, like that's really high on the Maslow needs, right? Whether you're warm or cold or hot, those are, those are some really simple things. So I really appreciate it. And again, super inspiring. Uh, uh, I look forward to tracking what's going on and up on with you. Awesome, thanks y'all. So uh, anyone else have any other questions? Uh, otherwise we'll start going over to the audience questions real quick. Um, all right, so here's the first one. Why are we including moderate to profound mentally handicapped individuals in the grade level standards testing? I mean, from my point of view, that's easy so that we can fail the school and then create a charter school on top of it. That's basically it, follow the money. But I'll go ahead and since I'm not the speaker, I'll get let, I'll let the experts talk. Uh, Anthony or Jennifer or Mike. Well, I, I think part of the part of the dilemma uh, or is there's been this idea if it if if it's not tested, then it won't get attention. And so it's it's almost like, I mean, I think I think some of us would see these tests as really being profoundly cruel. Uh, to some of the students, especially if they're, you know, if they're dealing with with whatever um, developmental issues they might have, but it's but um, advocates have have used this idea that uh, the students are somehow being neglected if they're not tested. So that's I think partly why why they get tested. I don't think it's a legitimate um, reason, but. I don't know if other speakers might comment on that. And anybody else want to answer that? Mike, where are you? I oh, probably dropped off. Or no, they're still here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Gail. And thanks, Jack, for all your wonderful knowledge and the great questions, Gail. Um, all right, let's go ahead and just jump to the next question and just keep going. The rhetoric against school choice and hence agency of Black and Latinx families, particularly in urban environments that attend charter schools, appears problematic, particularly when this agenda is driven by white liberal progressives. How do you as historians of public education reconcile this tension? So, you know, this is a, this is a huge thing. And we, um, we talk about it in the book, obviously, but it's something that I think about a lot. And because so often the wars that we're seeing play out in communities like Oakland pit particularly teachers against, you know, parents of color. And so as a group like our revolution, like you have to figure out how do you how do you engage with this in a from a you know sort of political standpoint, and so I think that the I would come back to what I raised earlier, which is you know like what are the demands being made, and what is it you know what is it that people really want, and so often as you go from city to city, you'll see that what's on offer from the groups that are bankrolling a lot of this is way smaller than what people on the ground actually want. And then the other part of this is that as we transition now from charter schools, which is, you know, like this has been the thing in Oakland, but now, you know, like you go to Florida, right? And the the end game is starting to come into view and, and it's not charter schools. The end game is not just vouchers, but, giving money directly to parents so that they can purchase any education product that they want and that they can be heavily advertised to, right? And so like that you would take parents out of a public system and move them into a, a unregulated marketplace. 
So then, like, my question would be, like, well, why is it that in order to exercise their choice that parents have to give up all their rights? You know, why, why is that? And so these are, like, choice sounds good, but there are, there's a lot of fine print and there are a lot of strings. And we have to figure out a way to talk about that that makes sense but is also not condescending, right? And I think this gets back to what Lamar was talking about that if you come to this conversation basically saying that the there's you know all we're going to do is criticize the solution that's being offered but not acknowledge the incredible disparities like you're that's a loser argument um so i'd be curious about mike i imagine that you are you're having these conversations all the time so how do you talk to parents who are like are feel very passionately that having a better choice is you know that 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 makes a lot of sense to them how do you tell them that that we have to change the way we think about this um year years and years of practice um and so uh, this is one of the things that journey for justice nationally has just done a lot of work around and so we had for example um nationally our we choose campaign where we were trying to directly counter those narratives and so our the campaign was you know we choose educational justice not the illusion of school choice and um you know for my campaign my uh campaign slogan was quality public schools in every neighborhood you know it's it's in oakland um, what's really happened is so many of our families attend charter schools because there are no other neighborhood schools and it's because of because of proximity and poverty more than anything else and we know that charter schools don't outperform public schools as a whole and so um but the other thing is i agree with parents who are looking for a better option for their families and so i am very careful to never criticize a family or a student for making that choice and i respect a family is always going to make the best choice or what they think is the best choice for their family now i blame the system for forcing them to make that choice I blame the school board in Oakland. That's why I ran for the school board um, is to change these conditions to allow families to make different choices. And so I just try to be real careful. And, and about three years ago, um, I learned how to talk about charter schools in a different way. So I don't talk anymore about uh, if charter schools are union or non-union. I don't even talk about whether they accept uh, a high enough rate of special education students. I talk about those schools receive public dollars and they're privately managed. And I regularly talk to families about if a charter school opens up across the street from your house, there's no guarantee that you can attend that school. And we need to build a system that's going to serve the whole community. Those have been the things that have started to resonate and really with Journey for Justice and with the NAACP and Movement for Black Lives, all endorsing these policy points about two years ago. So really big thing in the history of this movement was the NAACP nationally endorsing a moratorium on school privatization. Because from that point forward, no other group could claim school choice as a civil rights issue because we had the NAACP on board. And so over time, I don't think that has been a, a winning argument anymore and i hear it less and less and um and i really want to while we're on the subject groups like bats and like npe have learned how to do a really good job in partnering with community groups to avoid those optics and i think sometimes we need to be explicit in that to to not avoid those optics and just the last little thing i don't buy into this this uh dynamic that people pitch where it is teachers unions against parents and so i just reject that out of hand so hopefully we don't even get into those arguments awesome all right so let's go ahead and jump to the next question real quick uh 
What is the difference between charter schools and the privatized choice market-based higher ed model where Pell Grants can be used at various schools, private colleges, trade schools, community colleges? Any one of y'all, any one of y'all wanna take that? Uh, Jennifer or Jack, do you do you have a clear? I mean, I would say, um, you know, charter schools are getting a direct line of public funding for each and every student that they have. Um, so the uh, so the the Pell grants and so on are going to colleges, whether they're public or private, um, and paying for the for the fees or tuition associated with that. Um, so it's a little, it's indirect, whereas the charters are getting direct public funding. They're pulling from the same pots of money that the uh, public schools are pulling from. So in that sense, it's kind of a zero sum game and the public schools are losing um, dollars that are going to these privately controlled charter schools. I'm not, I, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but that's my best answer. Yeah, that works. Um, so we're gonna, we're almost, we're actually, 15 minutes over. So we're going to just take, we, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, but we're going to take this one last one. And then there's one more comment that you should probably listen to real quick. As a parent on the school, on my school district's budget committee, the main issue is that these federal funds are one time and therefore don't lend themselves well to any continuing programs. Um, Anthony and Mike, your thoughts about that? Uh, I, I want to throw in, you know, this is a huge systemic problem in, in public ed. Um, I worked, you know, you're constantly, as someone who's trying to do creative things, you're, uh, they want you to start, use grant money to get something started. And then as soon as you get started, they cut off the grant money because they want to fund something else. And they say that you have to institutionalize it and you haven't been successful if you don't. Um, so it's, it's a real problem where the funding sources shift, and this is going to be a real challenge with all of this, this money that's both this infrastructure money and the, um, and the, the COVID relief money, um, is that it's, it's going to be temporary. And, um, you know, it's part of the institutional starving of a public institution, you know, where the schools have been underfunded for so long and reliant on these um, on these programs and that feeds into the whole philanthropy being able to leverage their dollars, their discretionary dollars to steer the whole the whole ship of public ed. But I'm sure Mike Mike has some thoughts too. Well, of, of course, we, we get told the same. I, actually, I've been told that for 20 years that I've been paying attention. Oh, you can't use one-time dollars for that. I, I reject that. As a school board, we have fiduciary responsibility of our districts. This is where we need to be creative with our budgeting. So I am very determined, in, and we're allowed uh, under these COVID relief dollars, we have about a three-year window that's allowed to use this money. Um, we need to be creative and spread it over those three years. I'm gonna try to even spread it over five years. Stuff like we can buy like a uh, bad example, but food trucks right now and serve, get our, a fleet of new trucks now instead of deferring it over the next four years. And there's other ways that we can really deal with that. But here's how I'm looking at it in Oakland is we are going to try to use these one-time dollars to fund our three-year strategic plan to bring transformational change. That gives me as a new school board member three years to reprioritize our yearly budget and weed out some of the wasteful spending and consultants. And I am hopeful that um, there is going to be a higher level of funding for education going forward. Uh, like some of this money will be in place going forward. And between these added dollars and doing the internal work to reprioritize our budget, by the time we get to year three or year four, we've achieved enough savings to continue funding whatever we decide to fund now through our transformational change. I think what we need to do is we need to have smart and creative people involved with budgeting for our school districts. They tell us every time, oh, in year three, there's gonna be a $60 million hole. That never comes. And that's just not what happens. So I think this is another thing where we need to change the narrative. And especially as progressives, we need to say, 
we need to use these one-time dollars to maximize our resources going directly to the community. The days of austerity measures and building up a reserve are over. We are in a crisis and that crisis requires that we spend our resources to our maximum where they will directly have that impact. And so I think that's what we need to do. And if we run out of money in three years, then we all collectively go back to the state or go to the federal government and we we make that change happen. But I don't think we should hold back now for fear of year three or year four. And that's kind of this narrative that they've gotten us trapped in instead of us just saying, well, what do you mean we can't use the money for that? Let's use the money we have and we can make good decisions. We don't need somebody else telling us how to manage our resources. Does the, the budget say it can only be used for three years? Like if you go five years, are they going to say, or can we just plan for a 10 year program? It's, it's more basic than that. What, what, and there's about four different batches of money or five now that have come down. And, and what most, usually what they say is you, uh, this money needs to be budgeted by this time. And, and so we have basically, uh, depending on which pot, six to 18 months to budget it, but it doesn't have to be spent until three years out. And then beyond that, you can get creative and, and juggle around the different funds to really extend this money out if you're smart about managing your money. But, but people, uh, the professionals will always tell you, oh, you can't use one-time dollars for that, or oh, you need to be careful using one-time dollars for that. And I think maybe we should be having a, a different way of doing business. Yes, definitely. I'm definitely down for just saying, no, if they can do it, we can do it too. All right. So here's the last question slash comment and your both of y'all's thoughts on this. Uh, to uh, Mike Hutchinson, I'm a former charter parent and staff. Sending my son to charters wasn't a real choice. Things we didn't have in charters, students with disabilities, diversity, libraries, sports, arts was hard. I'm disheartened that many families lack space for a nuanced discussion about what we really want to do for our kids. And I've seen charter leaders frame and tell parents what we think for too long. Um, your thoughts, both of you? I mean, I, I feel like somebody teed me up with that one. Um, I, so I agree, um, but I really think it, so here's the best way I can tell. You know, when I first started realizing these things, was when my schools were being closed in 2011, 2012. And in looking into why my schools were threatened with closure, it kind of led me down the rabbit hole of learning about privatization and what was being done to Oakland. I think just this parent asking this question really reflects the change that's been happening. In Oakland, um, because of our collective work, a lot more of the community knows about these issues. Um, it's why I won my election because uh, being supported by charter schools and billionaires from across the country did not help my opponent where it had helped them in the past. And so I think we are starting to have these conversations. What's lacking right now and what I'm hopeful we can put together with the new strategic plan in Oakland is we don't have our affirmative plan to counter it. So I want to start reopening uh, sustainable community schools in Oakland, especially in the neighborhoods that have seen school closures. This is a certain model of schools with, that's based on community vision and full wraparound services and extra resources. And I think that's the missing piece right now where we've won the narrative and we've won the rhetorical fight but we don't have our plan for school design and our quality schools in place yet to rally people around. And so I'm really hopeful, you know, it's hard now because the pandemic <laughs> messed up some of my plans for coming into office, but I'm really hopeful that as we start to reopen our schools in Oakland, the next step for our new school board and this energy is to have our affirmative plan for quality public schools in every neighborhood. And that's what will silence those charter leaders once and for all, is when we beat them at their own game by really providing those high quality schools that they claim to have. And I would just add to that, I really appreciate Mike's sort of on the ground uh, focus on, on creating viable alternatives. 
Um, and I think that's really the core work that needs to be done. But I would mention also that um, the Network for Public Education has been doing a lot of digging into where public funds have been going and what charter schools have been doing with them. And uh, also the, the whole for-profit um, nature of, of the, a large part of the charter industry, um, which, is, which is really helping drive um, the lobbying that keeps it alive in, in Congress and in the Biden administration. And so I would encourage folks if you're interested in in really exploring the um, what's what's happening beyond the below the surface of the charter schools movement, um, take a look at. There's been three or four reports that the Network of Public Education has done over the last couple of years, looking into charter fraud and abuse, um, charter school scandals, um, the whole for profit. The last report that I mentioned. The whole for-profit nature of of charters and this whole myth that that charters are nonprofits, the whole structure is built to be sort of a shell that allows public monies to flow into a privately controlled, profitable enterprise. So um, that's something that isn't you know that is really uh, obscured by the way that charter schools have been marketed and the way that they're structured. Um, so, so take a look at the network for public education.org website, and you'll see some, you'll see some of that report reporting on national, uh, on the national level. Yeah. And we have those links on our website also for anyone that wants to check them out, our evolution, eastbay.org slash town halls. And you can see a list of other speakers and links to all their different organizations. Um, thanks to everyone. This was a great, great talk. I'm pretty sure we enlightened many people and uh, hopefully we'll get some uh, more broadcast. We're going to try to broadcast this on a community access television in the Bay area and see what happens and PBS and see if they let us, but let's see what happens. So I'm going to quickly pull up the intro or the outro slide deck. Uh, do you guys see the join us our evolution East Bay? Yeah. All right, cool. So this is uh thanks for everyone for coming to our town hall. Uh, our Revolution East Bay is our evolution east bay.org. And you can email us at info at our evolution east bay.org. If you go to our website, you can find all our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram links. And Badass Teachers Association is badassteachers.org. And you can email um, Melissa at contact.manager, betmanager at gmail.com. And if you go to our website, again, on our town halls page, we have the links to all the books and all the organizations for all the speakers here, plus their entire bios. And as you've seen, they're ridiculously good at what they do. And I want to thank all of them for coming out. And uh, thank you all for streaming and watching at home. So thanks a lot. And 